uh, finished off talking about the basis for trade. What we've managed to show is, is that it's possible um, by you know, specializing and engaging in trade to make people better off. We just don't know how it's going to work out, and that's essentially what we're going to be exploring uh, for the majority of the, the rest of the class. Um, we're going to start off our exploration on how this eventually works out with our first model, which is usually called the model of perfect competition. Um, it's the easiest to cope with. We'll often use it as a, uh, a baseline to compare other kinds of models of trade uh, against. Uh, it usually has a whole bunch of good characteristics. And i got to tell you that in the real world, it is oftentimes uh, rather rare. Um, but at the same time, it is oftentimes close to what we see. Uh, there's an old rule amongst uh, economists is that uh, you always have to explain to people that on occasion the price system does work as well as on occasion the price system doesn't work. So go ahead and uh, take a look at what we have up here, which is a, a list of the assumptions that we have about our perfectly competitive model. The first two are that there are a large number of buyers and sellers. Uh, what we're trying to do here is make it so that there's not a small number that can kind of get together uh, over dinner and decide on prices or have some kind of weaking agreement. Um, if you have a small number of buyers and sellers or you know, a small number of either one of them, they could to a certain uh, extent uh, collude even if there is no direct communication. A uh, classic example of this kind of communication without communicating is just watching what happens on a soccer field. Uh, after a while, you just know if this person has the ball, where you're supposed to be, and everything works out in the end. Now, if you don't have a large number of buyers, if you have a single buyer, you have something that's called a monopsony, which is single buyer. We're not going to investigate this in this class, but in your intermediate microclass, you'll probably take a look at a monopsony. If you have only one seller, what you'll have there is a monopoly, along with some other assumptions required. But what that is, is it's something we'll investigate later also. Now, besides having these large numbers, we have the added restriction that there are not allowed to be any collusion, which means that those large numbers can't get together and act like they're one buyer or one seller or that they are few. And so we make it so that there's a lot of barriers for some reason of getting together to go ahead and decide on price. The force assumption is a nice information environment. Um, this actually has two elements in it. The first one is that every single buyer and seller knows the prices of every transaction that has taken place. And so effectively, you get to watch all the auctions going on. You get to see all the bid prices and all the ask prices that are out there. Um, part of the reason for this is it makes it so that you can't form little isolated markets and you can't have secret deals. When you have secret deals, it suddenly looks like a, a monopoly or a monopsony uh, situation. So you always get to see what kind of prices are going on. The second aspect of the nice information environment is that Everybody in the market, buyers and sellers, has the same understanding of the good. So it's something like an apple. Everybody knows what an apple looks like. Everyone knows what makes a good apple. Everyone can identify a bad apple. And so we're specifically trying to stay away from things like automobiles, where the seller of an automobile tends to know a little bit more than the buyer of an automobile. So we're, we're trying to deal with having no information asymmetries. Everything is fully revealed. You can always tell the quality. Everyone has the same understanding. And this specifically avoids situations like um, uh, you having a different understanding of how uh, electricity is used in a household than somebody else. Everyone actually has this uh, identical knowledge and information. Assumption number five is free entry and free exit, which basically says that if you want to sell the product in this market, you can do it. And if you don't, you don't have to. And if you used to sell it at one point in time and decide not to, you can just step up and leave. Um, we need this here to make it so that our large number of buyers and sellers stays large. We need to make it so that it can't dwindle down to one by accident and then have it so it's blockaded so nobody can get in. Uh, having no free entry and, uh, and exit will have some other much stronger effects that we'll see once we start talking about our different kinds of markets uh, uh, surrounding uh, costs. Smithian prices, which is kind of a difficult one to get a hold of, but what Smithian prices are is 
making it so that it becomes more and more and more and more expensive to try to produce more of the product. So Smithian prices are the equivalent of those production possibilities frontiers that were bowed out. And uh, there are some alternatives here, um, but we're sticking with this to make it so that we don't end up with any kind of weird spikes and, and uh, to keep the assumptions very, very, very simple. We also have an assumption up there of homogenous goods, which means that all the things being sold by all the firms are exactly the same, which means this is going to be a great kind of model for talking about things like pinto beans, uh, rice, uh, oil, gasoline, where you can pretty much say that whatever is being sold by this particular dealer is exactly the same as what's being sold by this other dealer over here. Now the alternative is something that's called heterogeneous goods, and you can picture this as being you know, clothing that you wear that's always a little bit different and branded and based upon style. And we'll be dealing with what happens when you add heterogeneity when we start talking about monopolistic competition. Now it's often stated as a assumption, but is probably just a consequence of a few of these assumptions right here, is price taking behavior, and that's on the part of both the buyers and the sellers. And the idea is, is that because there is all this good information about, no one would be willing to take a price uh, that's higher than is prevailing in the market. Why should you pay extra? No one would be willing to accept a price which is lower, which is prevailing in the market, because why would you go ahead and accept less than what you were accepting elsewhere? And so the idea is, is that everyone pretty much observes what's out there in the market and then decides if they're going to buy or sell or how much they're going to buy or sell. There's no trying to manipulate the price. It's assumed that if you try to do something different, you'll be punished in some way, either by not making a sale or by not making a purchase. Those are the basic assumptions that we're going to have for our competitive model, and we're going to be introducing uh, uh, the idea of uh, an individual market that you can depict with supply and demand in the next screencast.